Okay, I think we might start now. Um, I am still Sarah Lennox, um, a um, professor emerita at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And I'm happy to welcome you to our last but not least, definitely not least, <laughs> um, keynote, um, which will be delivered by Priscilla Lane. Now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about her. Um, she's Associate Professor of German and Adjunct Associate Professor of African Diaspora Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her book, White Rebels in Black, German Appropriation of Black Popular Culture was published in 2018 by the University of Michigan Press. She has also published essays on Turkish German culture, translation, punk, and film. She recently translated Olivia Wenzel's debut novel, 1017 in Angst, which will be out in June. And she is currently finishing a manuscript on Afro-German Afrofuturism and a critical guide to Fassbinder's The Marriage of Maria Brown. And I think I can also say about Priscilla that she has done really uh, path-breaking work on um, making connections between um, African-American culture and Black German culture and cultural production. And she is, she has single-handedly moved the discussion of Afrofuturism um, out of the U.S. context into um, the German context. And I suspect we may hear some more about that in her talk today. So today she's going to be speaking to you about new Black German in German uh, subjectivity intersectionality in recent Black German novels. Hey, Priscilla, take it away. Um, before I start, thank you very much, Sarah, for your intro. Um, quick question, can you see just the title slide or all the slides at the bottom? Just the title. Okay, all right, I get confused. I have different monitors. Um, so first of all, thank you for the introduction. I also wanna give a shout out to Natasha Kelly, who also works on Afrofuturism in Germany. Um, so I'd like to share that honor with her. Um, and I want to thank Rosemary and everyone else who's organized and helped facilitate it this weekend. It's just been a really exciting conference. I've learned a lot, um, heard from so many new voices, uh, found all kinds of fascinating texts. And I'm especially grateful to hear from the um, Black Germans, uh, perspectives shared by Black Germans, Black Europeans, and other participants from throughout the diaspora. Um, while preparing for this talk, I asked myself, what can I contribute to this, to these discussions as an African American, as a person of Caribbean descent who spent a lot of time contemplating my own identity uh, here in the US, and as a person trained in German studies, uh, specifically in literary analysis. Um, so in this talk, I'm not speaking as someone with an authoritative voice about Black German experience, but as someone invested in, invested in and interested in Black German literature. So I'll get started here. Uh, so one of the inspirations for this talk was Stuart Hall's essay, What is the Black in Black Popular Culture? In his essay, Hall argues that Blackness is a construct and as such, how Blackness is understood um, including who and what is considered Black is dependent on time and place. I begin by referencing this essay because today I'd like us to ask ourselves what is unique about Black German literature? And because this question is anchored in a certain time, what I'm really asking is what is Black German literature today? I thought now would be an excellent opportunity to re-examine what characteristics we can identify about Black German literature, because in the past few years, there has been a flourishing of novels written by Black German authors. Um, and hold on, here are just a few. Okay. Um, so here's a collection of some of the more recent pu publications. Due to, the, due to the time allotted for this presentation, I will be drawing examples from just three of these novels, um, these three, Olivia Wenzel's uh, A Thousand Coils of Fear, Jackie Tomei's Brothers, and Noah So's The Black Madonna. 
Black German authors face a multitude of challenges, um, several of which Sharon Doduo too addresses in her recent speech in Klagenfurt entitled uh, Dürfen Schwarze Blumen malen, in English, May Blacks Paint Flowers. Among practical problems that many writers face, such as finding financial security or adequate, adequate child care to write, Otu also lists several specific issues that only racialized authors encounter. She writes, um, and I'll read the German but project the English translation. Viele schwarze Kunstschaffende arbeiten unter diesen oder ähnlichen Zwängen. Auch wenn wir es wollen, steht unsere Kunst nicht für sich allein. Sie wird zur Repräsentation einer ganzen Community. Wie gehen wir damit um? Es gibt schwarze deutsche Autorinnen, die in ihrer Arbeit schwarz sein gar nicht thematisieren. Andere schreiben zwar schwarze Hauptprotagonistinnen, entscheiden sich aber bewusst, gewaltvolle Diskriminierungserfahrungen nicht in den Mittelpunkt der Geschichte zu stellen. Mit Bruder wollte Jackie Tomei ausdrücklich kein Rassismusbuch schreiben. Und wieder andere Autorinnen beschreiben detailliert die diversen Lebensrealitäten ähm, ihrer schwarzen Figuren. Der im Frühjahr erschienenen Roman in Tausend Serpentinen Angst von Olivia Wenzel reflektiert die Geschichte einer schwarzen ostdeutschen queeren Frau. Es muss Platz für diese verschiedenen Romane geben. Und auch für jene von Chantal Fleur St. John, Schwarzgrund, Noah So, Zoe Hagen, Michelle Götting und noch viel mehr. Denn durch die Rezeption einer ganzen Palette an Arbeiten werden Positionen und Problematiken deutlicher, komplizierter, herausfordernder. What Otto is addressing is um, in a literary market dominated by white German authors, publishers and critics um, have a tendency to approach Black German literature according to a logic of scarcity rather than appreciating its diversity. Instead of accepting that authors like Tomei, Wenzel, and So each have something unique to contribute to the landscape, the market wants to place restrictions on authors and compare them to each other, as if there was only room for a single Black German narrative. Frequently, the sole questions the literary market asks of Black German books is, is this a narrative about racism or not? But this is not an easy question to answer about any of these novels. Take, for example, Tomei's novel. Um, so in Brothers, the two brothers in the novel's title are bira biracial Black East Germans, Mick and Gabriel. They are actually half brothers who not only have never met, but don't even know of each other's existence um, until the very end of the novel. What they share is an absent father, Idlis, a Senegalese student who studied medicine in the GDR, had an affair with Monica in East Berlin and later with Gabriela in Leipzig. Idlis left East Germany to pursue more opportunities in the West, which is why he did not take part in either of his son's upbringing. To re reiterate in her speech, Otu says of Tomei's novel, quote, Jackie Tomei expressly did not want to write a book about racism. But what exactly is a book about racism or in German, a racismus book? As, um, because it's not the case that Tomei's novel doesn't address racism at all. We learn, for example, that Mick had difficulties as a child, which the narrator implies may have something to do with the trauma of being the only black kid in his class and that his black father was not present for him to confide, confide in about this. Mick spends his adulthood chasing enlightenment on trips to the Caribbean, India, and Thailand. Gabrielle, on the other hand, tries to avoid most conversations about race and blackness. He moved to London to be invisible so he could disappear in a sea of diverse faces, which is why when he uh, is himself accused of racial bias, it comes as a shock to his system. Gabrielle, who's on the brink of a midlife crisis and a nervous breakdown, catches a young black woman letting her dog defecate outside of his house. He overreacts, chasing her down with the said poop in his hand, ultimately accidentally smearing her with it. He soon learns that she is actually a student from his class at university where he teaches architecture, when the student tells the press about the incident, they uncover other unflattering behavior of Gabriel's. For example, he once made fun of the same student to his colleagues, questioning whether she was a good fit for their program. Gabriel is shocked 
how this single incident has not only turned him into a predator, but stripped him of his racial identity. He laments, Und plötzlich war ich weiß, ich, es war nicht die einzige Verdrehung von Tatsachen an diesem Tag, aber die absurdeste. Nicht, dass die Tablets mich um, explizit als weiß bezeichnet hätten, das war nicht nötig. Ich wurde weiß, indem sie darauf verzichteten, zu schreiben, dass ich es nicht war. And so Gabriel, the black German man who never wanted people to focus on his blackness, now finds himself in a situation where he needs people to see his blackness to understand why he is innocent of this act of discrimination. He insists he would never commit a hate crime against someone else. But for the student, he was not a black nor a biracial man. He was an older man, a man of a particular class, a man with certain privileges and authority over her. And the truth is from an intersectional perspective, Gabrielle does have more power and privilege than this black woman. But he had never thought of it like that. Only now does he realize gender, Bildung, System, Klasse, Hautfarbe, alles kam aufs Tapet. Mir wurden mehr Macht, mehr Geld und mehr Einfluss unterstellt, als ich je erreichen werde. Thus, it's not that Tomei's novel doesn't address racism at all. Perhaps what Otu means is Tomei didn't want to write a book with the sole task of describing racism. Because Tomei's book does discuss racism, racism and race, just not in the simplified way white German audiences might expect. In the book, Dear Science, Catherine McKittrick questions the motivation of academic work about black people that simply describes their oppression. McKittrick writes, description is not liberation. Methodology that is relational, intertextual, interdisciplinary, interhuman and multidisciplinary honors black studies. Methodology that is relational, intertextual, interdisciplinary, interhuman and multidisciplinary provides an intellectual framework through which the study of black life cannot be reduced to authentic biological data, biologized identity discipline, that emanates some kind of truth about racial oppression. Black people are abject. And a solution to repair that truth, we must fix, correct, fix, designate, and detain, and get rid of the abject, end quote. So to bring up a, um, a common, another common interlocutor, in Black German studies, Audre Lorde makes a similar comment or made a similar comment when she said, it appears as understandable that Black people in general are not seen as having full lives. Black people are not seen as having relationships, loves, intricate and complex family relationships. We are seen as sociological examinations of psychological deprivation, as triumph of whatever, not as human. This is what Tomei means when she says she does not want to write a racismus book. She did not intend to write a book whose sole purpose was to describe some kind of truth about racial oppression. Instead, Tomei gives us, a comp us complex characters who are black and whose experience demands an analysis that is relational, intertextual, interdisciplinary, interhuman, and multidisciplinary. And this arguably is not just what black literature and black studies does, but what Black German literature does and what the study of Black German literature should do. Um, in the US, we have several pioneering scholars to thank for helping to define Black German literature and proposing that we as Germanists include it for our teaching and our research, such as Leroy Hopkins, Sarah Lennox, Michelle Wright, and Fatima al Tayeb. Hopkins wrote some of the first essays attempting to define Black German literature, while recently revisiting his essay, Speak So, so I Might See You from 1995, one of the things that struck me was his use of African-American models to understand black German literature. This is not surprising. We know that for decades, African-American culture, including literature, has had a strong influence in the black German community. Several of the papers we've heard this weekend have discussed this. One need only think of examples such as Lord, Maya, Maya Angelou, and Toni Morrison. In his essay, Hopkins compares Black German literature to the slave narrative, quote, in which the dehumanized object is empowered by relating his story, end quote. And we know how important this notion of conveying one's narrative has been for Black Germans, particularly those born since World War II, beginning with the publication of Faba Buchanan, or Showing Our Colors. 
But I worry there's a danger in viewing Black German literature as simply a response to or only inspired by African-American literature. In her monograph, African Diasporas, uh, Asia uh, Plakana Damka justifies her comparison of African-American literature and Black German literature by saying both groups are, quote, united by the struggle against racism and marginalization, which has led to the creation of a separate literature, end quote. quote. But what if we were to view Black German literature as a part of rather than separate from German literature as a whole? Um, could we then challenge the assertion that in Poika, Poikana Damka's words, quote, African-American literature presided over the birth of Afro-German literature, end quote. Uh, she is right to allege that Black German identity is a construction, which we've heard a lot over this weekend. And as much as all of our identities in this modern, modern age are constructions. But what I'd like to challenge is the suggestion that the Black German identities we encounter in these recent novels are constructed primarily vis-a-vis -vis African and African-American identities. In my discussion of these novels, you'll see that these Black German protagonists, um, on the one hand, see themselves as part of a greater diaspora. But they also see that as Black Germans, and it, as Black Germans of a particular class, they have a unique position vis-a-vis -vis other racialized groups. Just as Stuart Hall says of identity, quote, it's a construction, a process never completed, always in process. Identification is, in the end, conditional, lodged in contingency. Once secured, it does not obliterate difference. The total merging it su suggests is, in fact, a fantasy of incorporation. End quote. So at the start of this talk, I posed the question, what does German, Black German literature do? And now I'd like to propose um, that part of finding this out is to contextualize Black German literature within German literary history in order to resist the tendency of viewing it as a niche in literature or niche literature. Um, in another poignant essay, which is called Before the Border and discusses uh, race and literary translation, Sharon Dodua Otu stated the following. Und dann gibt es das Problem, dass deutschsprachige Literatur von schwarzen Menschen zumindest bis vor kurzem eher als Nischenliteratur angesehen wurde. Nicht weniger Rezensionen der Romane Tausend Serpentinen Angst von Olivia Wenzel oder Brüder von Jackie Tomei drehten sich um die vorhandenen oder fehlenden Rassismuserfahrungen der Protagonistinnen. Und wie zugänglich oder nachvollziehbar diese für nicht schwarze Lesende seien, als würde es bei der Schilderung solcher Erfahrungen darum gehen, ausschließlich andere Menschen dafür zu sensibilisieren. So, similar to the points made um, in her Klagenfurt speech, here Otu is saying, number one, Black German authors should not be expected to all do the same thing, Number two, they shouldn't be expected to convey experiences with racism as if the sole function of Black German literature is to educate white people about racism. So following, um, following O2's lead, I'm not interested in whether or not these novels address racism, but rather how they approach Black German subjectivity, and more specifically, how this approach to subjectivity could be considered part of a literary movement. So, in a way, uh, a movement that shares certain similarities while also allowing for differences. If critics, critics no notice certain similarities among these three books, instead of pitting them against each other by suggesting one author does something better or is copying another, why not take the approach we would typically take towards non-racialized authors and group them together within a literary movement? Specifically, I think it's worth considering how these novels could be contextualized against the German literary phenomenon of new subjectivity, most often associated with the 1970s. So when considering these three novels, what these three novels have in common, what strikes me is a certain turn inward. Black characters who not only grapple with the, their experience of a racist society, but who have additional personal concerns that have to do with how they relate to others. Sometimes those others are family members. The narrator in Wenzel's novel, for example, is constantly taking stock of her relationship with her mother and grandmother. In So's novel, The Black Madonna, the protagonist Fatu reflects on her lack of a relationship with her biological mother, her evolving relationship with her surrogate mother, 
and her challenging relationship with her daughter. And in Brothers, Gabrielle and Mick's lack of a relationship with their biological father has had a significant impact on their lives, whether or not they want to admit it. This focus on the family in Black German literature is new. We find it in Maya Yin's poetry, in Ika Hugo Marshall's Invisible Woman, and in Hans Jürgen Masakoy's Destined to Witness. What is new is how central it has become for Black German characters to consider their positionality vis-a-vis -vis other racialized and oppressed groups. In the A Thousand Quills of Fear, the narrator's travels to the US, Vietnam, and Morocco prompt her to think about her privilege as a German citizen. In The Black Madonna, Fatu tries to solve a crime that is taking place in her provincial Bavarian hometown, and she is aided by Grace, a West African refugee, who frequently checks Fatu's German privilege. And as you've already seen from my brief discussion of brothers, Gabrielle um, is, is surprised that a Black female student would accuse him of a hate crime and view him as just another male predator, irrespective of his racialized identity. The key word in all these examples is privilege. As Stuart Hall states, uh, quote, identification is a process of articulation, a suturing and overdetermination or a lack, but never a proper fit or a totality, end quote. And this is what the protagonists in these novels find as they try to relate to different groups. In each novel, the Black German protagonists are aware of how racism, racism impacts their lives, but the texts also focus on whether or not they become aware of the power and privilege they themselves have dependent on categories like citizenship, class, and gender. Um, so it's because of the way Black German characters in these novels think of both the objective and the subjective factor of identity that I would like to consider how Black German literature today is not only similar to, but expands upon the literary category of new subjectivity. New subjectivity is a term that was proposed by Marcel Reich-Ganicke to describe the direction taken by German literature in the 1970s. After the politicization of the late 1960s, following 1968, the German student movement and the, and the left-wing terrorism of the Red Army fraction, new subjectivity marked the movement when German authors turned inward to explore personal dreams and problems, in contrast to the more politically engaged literature of the 68ers but new subjectivity was not apolitical. Um, this period uh, was just marked by a strong emphasis on individual interests and motivations. Uh, just like the slogan of the new women's movement claimed the personal is political. Um, and, and these two were no longer separable. Today's black German literature is similar to new sub subjectivity in that it stresses self-reflection and experience without negating history or politics. For example, the Black German protagonists of the novels I'll discuss frequently attempt to better understand the motivation of the previous generation in order to better understand themselves. They wonder about Black and white absent parents. Why did they leave? And what kinds of hardships might they have dealt with? And part of grappling with subjectivity for them is a certain negotiation between the local, the national, and the global. Of all the epics of German literary history, I chose to situate these Black German novels vis-a-vis -vis new, new subjectivity because of its marker as exploring the individual and the issue of alienation. Of course, one could go further back in history to grapple with this, to Infinsamkeit in English sentimentalism or to Sturm und Drang, for example. But new subjectivity was a particular iteration of German literature contended with the individual at a certain place in time one that particularly grappled with questions of alienation. And as James Sneed, another African-American Germanist once said, who has more authority to speak about alienation in the modern world than black people? Before I get to my close readings um, of the two further novels I wanna discuss, I want to clarify why I said that black German novels expand the insights of new subjectivity. Linda C. Demerit describes protagonists in New Subjectivity as follows. Uh, the new subjective protagonist is an alienated individual, someone for whom the patterns, routines, and conventions of society are no longer valid. Um, accordingly, this individual stands alone and isolated, no longer part of the smoothly functioning whole, continuing without interruption for other people. 
Alienation is often precipitated by the experience of a personal cat catastrophe. So, in contrast, I would argue that for the protagonists of new Black German subjectivity, the experience that precipitates the feeling of alienation is racialization. And it is not that racially, it is not that um, rac racialization is the only trauma. Um, rather, they can be affected by any number of additional traumas um, that often relate to racialization, like in Benzel's novel, where she, the, the protagonist is, is affected by her brother's suicide, which is directly tied to his experience of racialization. Merritt describes a host of traumas that may affect a protagonist in a new subjective novel. She says, and I quote, new subjective traumas include death, sickness, abandonment, betrayal, and separation. Such traumas destroy the seeming security of the individual's everyday world. The subject is confronted with something inexplicable and meaningless, which invalidates all previous patterns of life. Everything which was once taken for granted becomes questionable and uncertain. The alienated individual no longer believes in a meaningful and comprehensive totality, which orders and explains the world and the purpose of a single existence within the world, end quote. Just like the protagonists of new subjectivity, the black German protagonists I'll discuss also experience death, sickness, abandonment, betrayal, and separation. But the thing that makes them doubt a quote, comprehensive totality, which orders and explains the world and the purpose of a single existence within this world, end quote, is racialization itself. Thus the key difference between white German protagonists and black German protagonists vis-a-vis -vis the category new subjectivity is that while white German protagonists are on the search for objective truth, the black German protagonists never had the naive perspective that there was objective truth to begin with. They were always already alienated by the system. They are just finally able to see the falseness of race and look beyond the veil. Um, and I would add, um, and recognize that not only are they themselves alienated, but white Germans are as well. So, furthermore, despite this feeling of alienation, the black German subjects in these novels do not see themselves as alone and isolated from everyone. Rather, they experience blackness as a constant negotiation between exclusion and inclusion. If being black in Germany means others conveying to you that you are to be excluded, then in the US or London, it means feeling included. But this incorporation, to quote Hall again, can only ever be partial. Benzel's protagonist knows she can only feel at home in Black America for the time being, just as Tomei's protagonist knows his sense of belonging in London is conditional, and So's protagonist knows her sense of belonging in Bavaria among white Germans or together with uh, refugees is also conditional, but for different reasons. What you will find in the examples I'll give you from these recent novels is that while the black German characters desire to stress their local belonging to a particular city or region, they often neglect to consider what implications their national belonging has for their identities. This observation is not meant to serve as a critique of the characters themselves. I believe these authors intentionally present us with imperfect flawed characters so that we can witness their progression from a lack of awareness of the implications of national belonging to being more fully aware of how the intersection of their identities influences their relationships with others. So, um, so my next example is from Noah So's novel, The Black Madonna, uh, which li um, literally emphasizes the local in its subtitle, Afro-Deutsche Heimat Krimi, an English Afro-German homeland detective novel. In So's novel, a Black German mother, Fatu Fall, and her adolescent daughter, Yassim, are spending the summer visiting her aunt, uh, Hortensia, who raised her, um, in the small town of Alt Uting in Bavaria. Fatu is treating this as an opportunity for Yassim to get to know her Bavarian roots, which is made difficult by the town's rural setting and her aunt's ignorance and insensitivity when it comes to talking about race. One, one of the unusual things about the novel is its genre, a krimi or a detective novel. As such, the novel centers around a crime. During a visit to a local church, specifically the Church of the Black Madonna, a reference to the real shrine of Our Lady in Altöting, Fatu and Yassim happen to witness an apparent terrorist attack. During the alleged terrorist attack, several men wearing ski masks enter the church and spray paint the following 
on, on the wall, a la Bakba. While the white German witnesses and the police are convinced this is the work of Muslim terrorists, Fatu and Yassim observed that not only is, the, is this incorrect Arabic, but the men were wearing dark makeup around their eyes as if to camouflage the part of their body that the ski masks would otherwise reveal to be white. The rest of the novel follows Fatu as she attempts to discover the true meaning, the true nature of this crime, leading her to uncover corruption among local politicians and church leaders. Throughout the novel, Fatu performs her Bavarianness. She enjoys it when Hortensia cooks the local cuisine. She makes use of local dialect whenever a white German attempts to question her belonging, even if she has long chosen Hamburg as her Wahlheimat or chosen home. However, Fatu isn't completely comfortable with how her Heimat may have shaped her. She only relies on her cultural cachet when it benefits her, such as when white Germans don't want to take her seriously. In these moments, stressing her local ties allows Fatu to challenge their assumptions about whiteness and German identity. Nevertheless, there are other moments when her comfort in this local setting becomes a problem, specifically when she meets Grace Ba, a West African refugee and activist who has lived in the area for 10 years. Grace makes several remarks that make Fatu realize just how much privilege, privilege she, is, she has and how much the local has shaped her identity. In the following scene, Grace confronts Fatu about her native, not her naive trust in the local SPD politicians or the local social Democrats who may market themselves as tolerant, but are as disinterested in helping immigrants as the local um, Christian Democrat, say the U politicians. Fatu states the following about the um, social democratic mayoral candidate. And here I'll read the German again and display the English. Um, oh, shoot. Where is okay, here we go. Dabei ist er doch eigentlich einer von den Guten. Grace sah sie ungläubig von der Seite an. Er engagiert sich für Jugendliche, sagte Fatu. Hast du seine Wahlplakate gesehen? Zischte Grace. Natürlich hatte sie das. Integration fördern, zuzugregulieren, bla bla bla. Dort hätte auch stehen können, Südeuropäer tolerieren, Roma und Afrikaner nicht reinlassen. Na also, sagte Grace, was ist daran denn gut, dass er schlimmer sein könnte? Das ist das Problem mit euch Deutschen. Er wird gut sein, aber ihr haltet immer zusammen. Fatu brach brauchte ein paar Momente, bis der Inhalt des Satzes bei ihr angekommen war. Sie war unter Schock. Wieso hatte Grace sie als Deutsche angegriffen, wo sie doch ebenso eine schwarze Frau war und deswegen die ganze Zeit für eine Ausländerin gehalten wurde? Das musste Grace doch klar sein. Fatu fühlte sich ungerecht behandelt. Ich wollte dich nicht verletzen. Bist du jetzt traurig, dass du Deutsche bist? fragte Grace. The scene reveals just how complex Fatu's identity is. On the one hand, when she was growing up in Alt Uting, she was the victim of both structural racism at school, for example, and her white German family's ignorance about racism and their lack of understanding about how to best equip her with the skills to survive in a majority white society. In addition to being racialized, there are other parts of her identity that place her in a marginalized and precarious position. She is a single mother and recently unemployed. At the same time, she enjoys certain privileges that Grace does not have. Fatu is a citizen who must not worry about fulfilling the requirements of legal residency. After spending her childhood in Altbüting, she was able to pick up and move to a more diverse city, Hamburg, where she enjoys living among liberal-minded Germans. For these reasons, Fatu does not immediately see the potential for violence contained in a phrase like regulate immigration. For her liberal mindset, and from the perspective of someone with German citizenship, this seems like a reasonable approach to immigration. Grace's remarks quickly rip her out of this fantasy. This is why Grace tells her, Ein paar Sachen haben wir gemeinsam, aber nicht alles, deine Mentalität. And there she lets Fatu fill in the blank. This encounter with Grace sends Fatu into an identity crisis. She had always considered herself in solidarity with other Black people. She had never considered in what ways she may be complicit in anti-Blackness. Furthermore, Fatu never thought of herself as being ashamed of her African identity, but she is also used to taking a defensive stance when white Germans ask her, where are you really from? So when Grace asks where her parents are from, she thinks the following, 
Grace musste doch selber darunter leiden, dass immer eine Erklärung von ihr verlangt wurde dafür, dass sie es überhaupt wagte, in Deutschland anwesend zu sein. Grace, however, insists, du kannst African Pride haben und trotzdem hier aufgewachsen sein. But although Fatu's initial reaction to Grace is defensiveness in these moments, by the end of the novel, she takes her new friendship with Grace as an opportunity to reevaluate her relationship to Black culture, which is why the novel ends with her embracing the new short Afro Grace recently cut for her in the style of South African singer Miriam Makeba, uh, based on a photo Fatu had once seen in a magazine as a child and had saved. The novel ends with the following lines. Sie fuhr die Fensterscheibe hoch und schaltete die Lüftung ein. Seit, den, äh, seit sie den kurzen Afro trug, gab es keine Strähne mehr, die sie sich äh, aus der Stirn pusten könnte. Sie kämmte sich stattdessen mit großer Geste über die Schläfe. Es fühlt sich gut an. So, uh, now I turn to my, the last novel I want to discuss. Um, so, in A Thousand Coils of Fear, the narrator is a queer, femme, black German whose local roots are in Thüringen. Throughout the novel, the nameless narrator recalls her grandmother and mother's experiences in the GDR and reflects both upon how their epigenetic trauma may have shaped her, but also how her life differs from theirs. For example, she has so much more mobility than they did. At the same time, it frustrates her that her grandmother doesn't understand um, that the freedom of mobility that came with a new passport from the Federal Republic of Germany does not negate her experiences with anti-black with anti-blackness. She reflects the following: Wenn ich ihr von der Schule erzählen würde, die Refugees in Kreuzberg vor einigen Jahren besetzt haben, wenn ich ihr von dem verzweifelten Mann erzählen würde, der auf dem Dach dieser Schule stand und damit drohte, sich in den Tod zu stürzen, sollte die Schule geräumt werden, weil er lieber sterben wollte, als abgeschoben zu, wer abgeschoben zu werden. Wenn ich meine Großmutter von dem weißen Polizisten erzählen würde, der auf dem Dach gegenüberstand und erst mit einer Banane, dann mit Handschellen dem Suizid gefährdeten zuwinkte, was sollte sie erwidern? Wenn ich meine Oma Rita fragen würde, ob sie Parallelen sehen könnte, könne zwischen dem Hass, der meinem Vater in der DDR entgegenschlug, auch von ihren Freundinnen, auch von ihren Arbeitskollegen und dem Hass, der mir und meinem Bruder entgegenschlug, von Mitschülerinnen, Eltern und allen, die sich generell für Hitler begeistern. Wenn ich fragen würde, ob sie Parallelen sehen können zwischen dem Hass, der heute systematisch schwarzen Menschen in den USA entgegenschlägt und dem Hass, der permanent und weltweit Geflüchteten entgegenschlägt, was sollte sie sagen? The narrator realizes her white German grandmother isn't capable of the same intersectional analysis of oppression as she is. But even if Benzel's narrator recognizes how anti-blackness affects her and undocumented black immigrants in similar ways, several additional instances help her better understand her positionality and privilege vis-a-vis -vis other racialized groups. Sometimes these experiences are a result of her travels. She traverses the globe from the US to Morocco and finally to Vietnam. In the US, she has the following uh, epitome. Und plötzlich begreifst du, diese warme Community schwarzer Menschen hier in den USA ist nur möglich, weil sie jahrhundertelang zum Überleben nötig war. Die Basis, auf der sich diese Menschen begegnen und bestärken, war und ist blutig ungerecht qualvoll. Du kannst damit es dir dankbar sein, dass du willkommener Gast in dieser Gemeinschaft bist, eine Touristin dieser auf Schmerz gewachsenen Blackness. Du kannst froh sein, dass dein Herz hier nur temporär ein paar düstere Schläge emittiert. So, the narrator is a welcome guest in the African American community, but the key word here is guest. She cannot become a permanent member of this community. Although Black Germans and African Americans may have uh, may share common experiences of racism, discrimination, and violence, and a past of slavery and colonialism. She knows she did not walk in the same shoes as the African Americans she encounters and their, or their ancestors. And as a result of her experience of her blackness and anti-black racism, and as a result, her experience of blackness and anti-black racism often looks different. In Morocco, she realizes what kinds of privileges she has as a German citizen 
when a taxi driver misunderstands a comment she makes about work and suggests she apply for a position as a cleaning as cleaning staff in a local hotel. Der Fahrer verweist mich an ein Hotel, in dem viele Schwarzafrikaner arbeiten. Ich könne dort mein uh, CV einreichen, wenn ich wolle, ob ich wisse, was ein CV sei. Das sei das, wo ich mein Leben auflisten würde. Ja, das wisse ich. Aber nein, nein, sage ich. Ich meinte eben, ich kann auch von hier aus arbeiten. Nicht, ich kann ja auch hier arbeiten. Ach so, der Taxifahrer wirkt enttäuscht. Ich stelle mir kurz den Alltag als Reinigungskraft in einem marokkanischen Hotel vor. Mit kleiner weißer Haube auf dem Kopf, in gebückter Haltung, stöhnen oder summen, ein anderes Leben weniger Kilometer entfernt. So, and finally, while in Vietnam, her ex-girlfriend Kim, who is Vietnamese-German, accuses her of Eurocentrism because she views Vietnamese facilities as substandard. In the following dialogue, um, Kim's speech is indented um, and the narrator's isn't. So the narrator asks Kim rhetorically, das findest du so richtig kaka, oder? Dass ich hier bei diesem Deutschen eingemietet habe. Der Typ hat Denselben den halben Stern aufgekauft. Aber die vietnamesische Regierung hat das doch gewollt mit der Gesetzänderung, oder? Dass die ausländischen Investoren jetzt loslegen. Weißt du, die Kinder, die jetzt hier selbstverständlich Fußball spielen oder Musik hören, die dürfen in zehn Jahren die neuen Beach Resorts nicht mehr betreten, außer sie sind dort angestellt. Hm, Lothar ist vielleicht nett, aber was der hier an Neokolonialismus absieht, geht gar nicht. Diese Bungalow sehen aus wie Mini-Reihenhäuser in Schwaben. Das hat nichts damit zu tun, wie die Leute hier leben. Ich hatte halt Bock auf deutsche Sauberkeit und Erholung. Ich weiß. Well, the scenes I've just um, shared from the novel uh, all occur while the narrator is traveling abroad. There are also moments in the text that demonstrate how her emerging understanding of privilege changes the way she interacts with other racialized people within Germany as well. For example, in one scene, she's riding her bike through Brandenburg when she happens to meet a young man um, she takes a liking to. The narrator doesn't explicitly mention his race. We only learn his name is Jacob and that the two of them have some banter back and forth and exchange numbers, hoping to meet later again. The only indication that Jacob might be black comes about when she walks him back to his home and describes his living circumstances. Später geht ihr zusammen ein Stück die Landstraße entlang, teilt ein Müsli-Riegel, du fragst nicht nach seiner, nach seiner Herkunft. Schließlich bleibt ihr vor einem großen eisernen Tor stehen. Dahinter siehst du ein mehrgeschossiges, mehrgeschossiges Gebäude, das an einer Scheune und ein Krankenhaus zugleich erinnert. Jacob, fragt, uh, Jacob sagt, I must go here now, und sieht traurig aus. In dem Moment fährt ein blauer Trabi die Straße entlang. Der weiße Fahrer kurbelt die Scheibe runter, reckt den Arm raus, formt im Vorbeifahren mit der Hand einer Pistole, zielt auf euch und drückt ab. Jacob sieht es nicht, der Mann fährt hinter seinem Rücken vorbei. Although the, character, although the narrator doesn't describe Jacob as a black refugee, we know this is the case because of several things, so several observations. First, the white man who pretends to shoot both of them. Second, the narrator wishes she could, later wishes she could give him her dead brother's passport so he could travel freely. Um, third, the fact that he speaks to her in English. And finally, the building in which he lives um, that looks like a prison and a hospital, or she says a, a barn and a hospital, um, sounds like the description of an asylum seeker's home. The narrator does not introduce Jacob as a black refugee living in Brandenburg because she would like to believe that his citizen status doesn't influence whether or not she wants to befriend him or date him. And that's why she explicitly says, I didn't ask him where he's from. But the reality is his legal status in Germany limits his mobility in contrast to her. And this leaves her feeling guilty later. Du schlägst verwirrt vor, dass Jacob dich ja mal in Berlin besuchen könne und ihr tauscht Handynummern. Jedes Mal, wenn er dir in den folgenden Wochen schreibt, weißt du nicht, was du antworten solltest. Hey girl, have you forgotten about me? Hello? 
Hättest du Jacob den Pass deines Bruders gegeben, könnte er jetzt vielleicht in einer Straße wohnen, auf der weniger Trabis mit pantomimfreudigen Insassen herumtrückern. Hey girl, why, won't you, uh, why don't you answer my... Sorry, but I can go wherever I want and you can go nowhere. Bye. Irgendwann blockierst du Jacobs Nummer. So um, here I would like to conclude um, by addressing the question of why I find it useful to use an already existing category like new subjectivity to describe uh, the attitudes conveyed in these novels rather than creating a brand new category, which is also completely po a possibility. So return to the point To return to the point I made at the very beginning of the paper, when the German literary market expects Black German novels to explicitly center racism, it not only places limitations on what we expect from Black German literature, but it also too narrowly defines the effects of racism. These three novels are about the development of Black German subjectivity and how this subjectivity is always constructed in relation to others. This is why each novel emphasizes an intersectional approach to understanding Black German identity. Each character's trials and tribulations are about race, but they are also about gender, citizenship, sexuality, and any number of additional identity categories. White Germans' failure to recognize how formative racialization can be causes them to focus too much on racial violence that you can see, as opposed to the racial violence that's psychological. This is why Wenzel's novel, in particular, places so much emphasis on mental health. During the course of the novel, her narrator, narrator makes several attempts to find a therapist to help her through work through her anxiety. Her first attempt fails, largely because the white therapist lacks an understanding of how all-encompassing the experience of racialization can be. After she describes her mental state to him, the therapist responds, Sie fühlen sich zerrissen zwischen den Kulturen. Ich denke, das sind Probleme, die im Hier und Jetzt bestehen, mit der Außenwelt. Mein Therapieangebot richtet sich ja eher an Menschen, die von der Vergangenheit belastet sind. Ich denke deshalb, dass ich ihnen mit meinem Angebot nicht helfen kann. Und ihre Fragen sind ja im Grunde nicht thera therapeutisch zu klären. His answer suggests that Black people's problems can only be linked to structural external societal issues and do not simultaneously relate to the psyche and trauma. This would assign the space of inward looking subjectivity to whites only. By proposing the category of new Black German subjectivity, I argue that considering these works as expanding on new subjectivity would help acknowledge that Black people are just as affected by inner conflict as by outside stressors In fact, the outside stressors of racism and racialization often contribute to the inner conflict. In my op opinion, positioning these Black German novels vis-a-vis -vis new subjectivity require, requires the category to be expanded. And I will conclude with these arguments about Black German literature today. So um, Black German literature today does not seek to describe racism, but rather it provides an intersectional critique of racism Black German literature emphasizes both local and global connections while negotiating them vis-a-vis -vis the national. And finally, Black German literature of this decade indicates a turn inward, but unlike new subjectivity, this is a turn inward that is still constantly, constantly aware of positionality and intersectionality and aware that white people are also fragmented, even if they don't have the added uh, layer of double consciousness that Black Germans experience. These are, of course, observations based on a very small sampling of texts. Um, I know there a few uh, more recent novels have been published, and uh, I hope to read more um, in order to further test uh, whether my theory still holds. Um, I also intend to read several of the new subjectivity texts by white Germans from the 1970s in order to better understand how those texts thematize alienation in the absence of a discussion of race. Thank you for your time. Sorry, um, I was muted as so often. Um, thank you so much, Priscilla. I, I was really, um, completely um, interested in and informed by this 
um, by this talk, and I'm sure this is going to inform um, research on uh, Black journal literature forever after. So thank you so very much. So we've got about 10 minutes um, for discussion. So I want to encourage you all to put, I'm looking at the chat too, but I want to encourage you to put um, your questions in the Q&A. And before we go to the Q&A, I want to encourage you to stay for the next session, which is the students who are working with the BGHRA. And this is the Nachfuchs. These are the people that are going to take um, all these discussions further. So I hope you will be there to encourage them and cheer them on because I think that'll be really important to them. Um, so while we're waiting for questions in the Q&A, um, I have a question. Um, Priscilla, I'm wondering if, um, if Black um, German reviewers have commented on these books and what they've said and if their, um, if their assessments are anything like yours. Thanks for that question, uh, Sarah. I unfortunately haven't seen any um, reviews by Black German critics. Um, I think Sharon Dodua Otu is, are the only remarks I've found about these novels. I'm, I'm still trying to look into the, you know, the reception history of them. Uh, I know that I know that uh, Wenzel's novel has gotten a lot of positive press. Um, and I, I attended an event she did where she mentioned people have been drawing this comparison with Grudar. Um, but I'm still trying to find find that link. Uh, people, have been mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I I if anybody you know knows of a, an outlet where I can hear you know what how the community have, has responded to these texts, I would really like to know that. All all I can say is that I'm sure that uh, the Black German community is happy to have you know increasing representation in all forms of publishing, including in the big, you know, publishing houses. Um, so here's a really interesting question. Um, to what extent do you feel these works might find a place in the tradition of the Bildungsroman or anti Bildungsroman? Yeah, that is an interesting question. I, I hadn't thought about the Bildungsroman. I think one of the, one of the things that inspired my thoughts for this talk was, um, you know, as you mentioned, Sarah, I've also done work in Turkish German literature and uh, Ferdun Zaymalu is an author I, I really love and I read a lot of his works. And I noticed throughout his career, he was shifting from the kind of uh, rebellious um, text he, he wrote early on to engaging more with genre literature. So he wrote like a kind of a belief roman in the vein of Vata. He wrote a Martin Luther Roman. So it, it made me think more about, you know, people of color in Germany who grew up in Germany with all of, with this literary history and made themselves be interested in engaging with it. Um, but the Bildungsroman, I mean, I think from the perspective of like postmodernism, yeah, the, the Bildungsroman feels kind of stale because it, I think it still conveys this notion of the whole subject, the the subject who isn't fragmented or fractured, the subject who who can find a relatively stable identity. And I definitely feel that these novels aren't suggesting that. Um, I'd have to look more into the anti building so on. That's not, it's not a genre I've really worked with, um, but it's definitely possible. Cause again, I would say that any of these authors who've grown up in Germany and gone to school there, you know, know all of these, you know, canonical texts. And I think it's to be expected that they would kind of comment on this German literary tradition, a little bit like, uh, you know, Maya Yim references Heine, you know, in, in Deutschland, uh, right. what, what, uh, Deutsch, Deutschland im Herbst, sorry, my memory is not working well today. Okay, here's another one, a really interesting one too. Jennifer Tega's book is not about, is not a novel, it's an autobiography. Amon, my Großvater had the Mishka Schossen, but how does it fit in with the remarks you've made today? Yeah, I would definitely say, and hi, Mel, we've, we've corresponded in the past. Um, I would say that um, 
the, the autobiography, Black German autobi autobiographies to me are a whole separate genre. Um, a lot of the um, early texts coming out in the 80s and 90s, you know, I mentioned Masakwa, I mentioned Ike Hugo Marshall were autobiographies. And for me, those have a specific uh, goal. Um, for me, a lot of those texts were about writing Black Germans into the national narrative, um, demanding recognition from German society that, that you can be Black and German, that, that these people exist, that they have a history. To me, these more recent novels uh, often are more experimental, I would say, in terms of form. So like Wenzel's novel, I, I have an essay where I describe that as autofiction um, because there, there seem to be autobiographical elements, but, but the narrator seems to constantly be like evading the gaze. And, and the way that the text is written, maybe you could see that from the slides with sometimes it's cursive, sometimes there's indentation, sometimes cabral. There's, it's just like this constant dialogue where you're not always sure who's talking and what time it is and what's true and what's not. Um, and to me, that's a very different style than the autobiography. Instead of attesting to some truth, it's more raising questions and kind of embracing this notion of an identity that's never completed, you know, that can never really be pinned down. Mm -hmm. Uh, another person in the audience wants to know whether you've taught these books to graduate students yet. And if so, how were they received? And did you use them in conjunction with white German texts of new subjectivity? Yeah, thank you for that question. I'm actually teaching a um, grad seminar on Black German studies right now. And we will be reading all three of those novels uh, as well as like five or six more. Um, so uh, I, we haven't gotten to the novels yet, so I'm looking forward to hearing the students' responses. I haven't taught them with new subjectivity novels yet. That's, that's something I, I may want to do in the future, I think. Um, what I have done is I always try to bring in Black German literature in whatever class that I happen to be teaching. So like I taught a class on Berlin and we read like Dublin and we read Fontana and we read Michael Göttingen, you know? Um, and what I found is when I do that, students are just really happy to have a new perspective. And to me, it's, it's really important to sometimes just focus on black German culture, but also to, to just bring it in whenever relevant to show that it can always be relevant. Okay, and we maybe have time for one more and I'm gonna to add to this question, a question I have. Um, could you elucidate a bit on one of the suggestions you listed in your conclusion that black German novels either emphasize or should emphasize local and global connections? And my question in addition is, um, is there a difference in the local? Is Does that inflect um, Black German subjectivity, and I'm particularly interested in whether an, an East German subjectivity, East Black German subjectivity, is different than a West Black German subjectivity. Yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, to, just to clarify, I'm not saying they should do that. To me, that's what they are doing. That, that's what I observe them doing, discussing the local and the global. Um, and to your question, Sarah, I would definitely say there's a difference. Um, so for me, you know, Re Wenzel's text and Tomei's text deal with East Germany, specifically um, uh, So's text is located in Bavaria. And yeah, I mean, for Wenzel's text and Tomei's text, the GDR reunification are a very important part of those stories. Um, so for example, I mentioned in Wenzel's text that her narrators constantly uh, uh, thinking about all of the limitations her her parents had, her parents or grandparents growing up in the GDR, and how she has more freedom, but at the same time she's dealing with anti-blackness and what does that mean? Whereas I would say in So's novel, yeah, reunification, East German identity doesn't play a role at all because it's more, you know, grappling with uh, Bavarian uh, a, a Bavarian identity. Okay, we have we have a whole bunch more <laughs> good questions. Maybe, um, I, I can maybe try to save them. I okay, you think I can, you, yes. Yeah, I'll try to save them. Emily and Claire and um, Anka, 
Oh gosh, there's more than that. Well, <laughs> they keep coming. They keep coming. Okay. I, well, during the break, I can copy and paste and and take time to answer, and then hopefully good, follow good. up with people. So I think we need to end now, so the people have a little time for a break um, before we go into the next session. Please don't go away. Please stay around and support our students. Um, and uh, Priscilla, would you do you have any concluding words you'd like to share with us? Uh, just that I'm really looking forward to the student panel as well. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I hope everyone sticks around for that. And thanks again to the conference organizers. This conference has been really wonderful this weekend. So. Yes. So thank you so much, Priscilla. Thank you. Thank you so much to the audience. And we'll see you in 15 minutes or 13 minutes. Okay. Bye-bye.